Have you ever wondered how people like Apple and Samsung managed to fit eight core CPUs inside their absolutely tiny phones and how they managed to stay so incredibly efficient? Well, in this video, I want to explain just that. But first, if you haven't already, consider subscribing for more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So how do you go from an eight core CPU being this size to something that can actually fit inside your phone? Well, there's an important distinction to note here. This eight core CPU isn't actually this size. The majority of this size and weight is taken up by the integrated heat spreader, IHS on top, and the PCB and the pins or uh, pads on the back. The actual chip or the, uh, the die as it's known is actually a lot, lot smaller. And so that definitely helps. So that alone doesn't make these desktop chips fit inside your phone. The main difference or main point to note here is that while mobile CPUs are still incredibly impressive and incredibly powerful for their size and form factor, they're nowhere near as powerful as desktop chips. For example, the Ryzen 3700X, AMD's of lowest power 8 core, that it has a TDP or thermal design power of 65 watts with a, an actual power draw usage of about 80 watts. For comparison, the Snapdragon 855 that's in a number of different phones is a 5 watt TDP chip. You can imagine the performance implications of having so little power available to it by comparison. To illustrate that point, I ran Geekbench 5 on both my phone, which is a OnePlus 7T Pro, and my desktop, which is a Ryzen 2700 based system. Admittedly, I didn't close any of the four web browsers, four VS Code windows, and the you know multitude of other applications that were open and running. So kind of a worst case scenario for my desktop, but either way, when you look at the results, while the phone's single core performance is incredibly impressive, the multi-core performance, yeah, the PC kind of walks away with it. That's to be expected, of course, but still interesting to see. So they're lower power, but is that it? Well, not quite. See, mobile CPUs aren't just CPUs. Something like a Snapdragon 855 not only has a CPU inside or CPU cores, but it also has a GPU, also has a hardware accelerator and a image processor, a security module, a modem, and a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth controller on top of just those CPU cores. Now that's known as a SOC or system on chip. And that essentially means that the chip is fairly well self-contained. All you need to do is give it power and some memory and it can generally handle itself. Now, you, the block diagram that's on screen should give you a good idea of how that's laid out, but a good example of this is to look at the transistor counts. Now, transistors are the absolutely tiny little micro switches that act as the basis for pretty much all processors, and something like a Snapdragon 855 has 6.7 billion of them. Now, compare that to a desktop chip, say a Ryzen 2700X, that has just shy of 5 billion, which, while that does sound pretty close, and at least in percentages, it is, but remember that that desktop chip is just a CPU and not everything else that the mobile chip has. That means that only a fraction of those 6.7 billion transistors can be used for actual CPU cores, making for a much less powerful design. One way they get around this though is using the ARM architecture. Now ARM is a British company that effectively designs the CPU cores themselves and then licenses those designs to people like Qualcomm who will integrate them into full chips and go and manufacture them. ARM uses RISC or reduced instruction set computing, which is essentially a way of simplifying the instruction set process and the computing process to make each core more efficient. For example, a desktop processor might want to multiply two numbers stored in two blocks in memory, and so it will run the command MULT to 3, 52, with 2, 3, and 52 being the addresses of those numbers in memory, and that's pretty much it. On a RISC processor though, you have to manually load each value. So you'd run load A to A register, comma two, three, and load B, B register, uh, comma five, two. And then you can go and do the arithmetic on it. So prod A, B, and then you would store that value by doing store uh, two, three, comma, A. Now that might sound less efficient, but it's important to know that the desktop processor it still has to do all of the things the RISC processor does, 
but the important thing is it has to know to do that based on the instruction you give it, rather than the risk processor just doing exactly what you tell it to. Because of this, mobile processors are incredibly efficient with incredibly low transistor counts. So for the most part, that's how you get an 8-core CPU to fit inside an incredibly small and low power and efficient form factor like a phone. Well, there are a few exceptions here. Of course, Apple's own designs are incredibly powerful by comparison to Qualcomm and Samsung's options, but they still follow the same pattern, so not a big difference there. Now, if you have any questions about how mobile CPUs work or anything else, feel free to leave those in the comments down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Otherwise, like I said at the start, if you want to see more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, then you can hit that subscribe button and the bell notification icon. You can also check out the links in the description down below. There's a few Amazon affiliate links down there uh, to my PC setup if you're interested. There's also a few links to some phones if you're interested as well. And there's also a load of other links down there too for ways that you can support me like merch for hoodies and t-shirts like this one or a load of other cool designs. There's also Streamlabs OBS if you want to start streaming, Humble Bundle for cheap games to support charities too, and a load of other stuff as well. I'm going to leave the Tech Explained playlist on the end if you want to learn more about how CPUs and GPUs work and desktops and a load of other stuff too, so feel free to check it out. If you've got any questions, like I said, leave those in the comments down below. Otherwise, we'll see you all in the next video.